Lumped in with the glam metal scene, White Lion didn't follow the typical formula of a lot of bands who were popular at the time. In fact, White Lion had to wait for fame. Instead, the origins of the band began with frontman Mike Tramp, who was Danish, and fronted the group Mabel, who had a more pop-influenced sound. Mabel's members were 10 years older than him as he started in the band when he was around 14 or 15. Mabel was originally a pretty hard rocking band, but they soon switched their sound to be more pop oriented. And Mabel actually found some success in Europe, releasing six albums. In one interview, Tramp told the paper that they were bigger than Queen by the late 70s, but I'm not sure if he was actually joking or not. But Tramp's heart wasn't really in the group, and he wanted to play in a band that was harder rocking, similar to the likes of Van Halen and ACDC and Mabel soon rebranded themselves the Studs and moved across the pond to America's East Coast, New York City. They just happened to meet their manager at a discotheque in Spain one night who offered to manage the band and in exchange he let them live in his apartment in New York. It was during the plane ride over from Europe to New York, the band was seated with a bunch of young schoolgirls, and Tramp started to focus group test some of the names of their new band. They eventually settled on Danish Lion. But it wasn't meant to be. The band really couldn't find any success stateside, and they soon broke up with most of the members heading back home to Europe. But Tramp wasn't done yet in America, and he still wanted to play music. It was in 1982 at a Danish Lion show in New York, Tramp would meet a guitarist named Vito Brada and form a band with him called White Lion. Brada was already an accomplished guitarist, playing in the group Dreamer. Tramp originally thought Brada was, as he put it, and I quote, a douchebag walking into the venue that both bands were playing on the same night and asked to plug into Danish Lion's amps. Tramp said sure, hoping to see the guitarist make a fool of himself, and he didn't. Instead, he ripped through a bunch of Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes solos. Despite having a musical connection, the pair had opposite work ethics. Tramp was a go-getter, while Brada lived more of a pampered life with his parents, so it was natural they were going to butt heads down the road. They would go through a few lineup changes on the rhythm side, with bassist James Lomenzo and drummer Greg D'Angelo joining the group. White Lines soon became regulars at a New York club named Le Amour in Brooklyn, and they consistently sold out the venue. Women seemed to love Michael Tramp, and you had this Eddie Van Halen-type guitarist in Vito Brada. The owners of the club actually had a management company called Loud and Proud that took the band under their wing. Loud and Proud also had contacts in Germany, where they sent the band to record their first album, 1985's Fight to Survive. It was shortly after recording the album and returning home, the band actually nabbed a deal with Elektra Records. The label gave the band a $200,000 signing bonus just to get the rights to their first album. Things were looking up though, right? Well, not exactly. Elektra, who already had Dawkin and Molly Crew on the roster, opted not to put out the album. Apparently the record bore too many similarities to those groups, so the band lost the recording contract. They did however get to keep that label advance, and the band's manager worked out a deal to release the record in Japan. Brada soon landed on the number 3 spot on Japan's edition of Guitar Player Magazine's Best Guitar Players at the time. And the record eventually got a US release about a year later, but it would break first in Europe thanks to positive press coverage, Soon enough countries were lining up to stock their first album, and according to Krang Magazine, White Lion's debut record was the number one most imported record at the time. It was during this time White Lion also landed a role in the Steven Spielberg film The Money Pit, starring Tom Hanks. It would be a producer from Germany who offered for the band to come overseas again and record their second album, but the band weren't happy with the final results. They would end up hooking up with producer Michael Wagner in LA and re-recording the record. It was during this time the band was on tour in the States with a group called Mannequin, it was at a gig in Baltimore that Jason Flom, the head of A&R for Atlantic Records, was in attendance. He was initially interested in signing Mannequin, but the members of White Lion got Flom so intoxicated at the gig that he agreed to sign White Lion. Released in 1987, the band's sophomore effort Pride was dead on arrival according to Flom in the book Nothing But A Good Time. But it would be a tiny radio station in Minneapolis that started playing the song Wait, and the album soon took off. A video soon followed, and while Tramp had to frantically call MTV to get the video played, the dominoes finally fell in place. The record would go on to be a huge success, selling 2 million copies, thanks to the three big singles Wait, Tell Me, and When the Children Cry. Guitarist Vito Brada soon became singled out for his musicianship, and the band also got singled out in the press for being a safe, good-looking band and drew many comparisons to Bon Jovi, with some people claiming they were a Bon Jovi clone. They even landed themselves on tour with Aerosmith, and a tour with ACDC, and eventually finished things off with Striper. But the band's third record proved to be the group's undoing. It was by the late 80s the band members had money, and that feeling of being a family was no longer present, as they technically didn't really need each other. The band got an offer they couldn't refuse though, opening for Ozzy, while being paid $25,000 a show. 
They would be rushed by their label and management to put out their third record ahead of those gigs, and so within a week of getting off the road to promote Pride, they were already in Palm Springs in a deserted motel writing new music. One of the first songs they came up with was a tune called Warfighter, a song that Tramp wrote about a Greenpeace boat being sunk by French naval forces. Brad, I would remark in Nothing But A Good Time how the band had a multi-platinum album, and Tramp was now writing songs about boats. The a r man for the label would tell Vito famously, man, tell Tramp that Saving Whales doesn't sell albums, leather pants do. But the album stiffed, it only went gold selling a quarter of its predecessor. The band would return in 1991 with Main Attraction, but the scene had changed and bad luck hit the band. Tramp would recall in Nothing But A Good Time that around the time of the album's release, almost half of Atlantic staff were on vacation. Apparently somebody at the label dropped the ball on promoting the record and singles. The band actually broke up a few weeks before Nirvana's Nevermind came out. The final nail in the coffin was when Tramp went to Atlantic's offices and asked for President Doug Morris, and the receptionist said he wasn't available. When he told the receptionist to tell Morris that Sebastian Bach of Skid Row was here to see him, Morris came out to greet him, and Tramp turned around and walked out the office. The band would break up in 1991. Tramp would recall to a fan Q&A on the Will Travel for Gigs YouTube channel that he met the guitarist when he was in New York to see his manager. It turned out Tramp's manager only lived 10 minutes from where Vito was living at the time. Vito has since disappeared from the music industry, investing his money wisely, telling Guitar World how he lives off his publishing, revealing, and I quote, The thing about the band was we were worldwide. We've gotten checks from Zimbabwe, from Lebanon, and from every single country you can imagine. It was in 1997 Vito suffered a bad wrist injury when he was playing guitar on his back watching TV one day when he heard his wrist snap. As for what happened to him, well his plan wasn't to just vanish from the music industry after leaving White Lion. He would admit to Guitar World he was originally going to put out a classically influenced guitar record, but due to his fingernails becoming more brittle as he got older, that idea never came to fruition. Also contributing to his decision to leave the music business for good, was the fact that he hated the music industry and he was also taking care of his aging parents. He'd recall to Guitar World going into his label's office one day and hearing Robert Plant's manager slamming the label reps for not properly promoting his client. The label rep responded to the manager saying, you know what your problem is? You play too good. You need to start playing sloppy because that's what kids are into these days. And I took that as my exit. You gotta be kidding me. You want me to suck? In the early 2000s, Tramp would try to revive the band using the name White Lion but lawsuits ensued between him and Vito. Vito claimed to have come up with the name one day when he drove by a White Castle restaurant. Then Tramp tried to get the original members back for a reunion, but that didn't work. In the subsequent years, Tramp has continued on with a solo career, while Vito's given a handful of interviews over the years. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again in Rock and Stories. Take care.